Okay, so after, you know, hinting around to this for a while, um, we're actually going to look at, specifically at Joyce Meyer and a, um, a thing that she was teaching about uh, us being little gods. And I keep going back about back and forth about this, about whether she is or is not a false teacher. And so I think I'm going to give my, my pretty confident answer tonight. Um, I shared the video on the Yams Facebook page if you guys would like to watch it. Um, you know, if I say something tonight and you're not overly clear, it's on there already. So I posted it earlier today, probably this morning sometime. So if you guys did want to watch it, you'd have all day to watch it. So the question is, are we little gods? Because now I'll get to what she says in just a minute. But first, let's just let's look at this. Psalm 82 says this. God stands in the divine assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods, plural. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Provide justice for the needy and the fatherless. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and needy. Save them from the power of the wicked. They do not know or understand. They wander in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now verse 6. I said, this is God speaking, you are gods. So this is, God, God says this. He says, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. However, you will die like humans and fall like any other ruler. Rise up, God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. So this gets a little bit confusing. So the question, so the, is the question, are we little gods? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> there's, there's just, there's, a, it's not, it's not that simple. So let me explain, okay? Uh, the word translated here as uh, gods is a very generic word uh, from from the Canaanite area. It basically means, um, well, it has a wide variety of of, of translation. Ancient languages didn't really work as precise as modern ones. So you would have the same thing maybe stand in line for quite a wide variety of, of meanings um, and the context would be the soul dependent on what the heck it meant. So the word used here is Elohim which is the same word uh, used generically for the God of the Bible, the God that we believe. Um, it also can be used in combination of other gods, like um, talking about Baal, which is not just a god. There's we're actually a series of Baals, but then also Baal can mean uh, a lord or a master, not just God. Um, there's just a lot of a lot of wide variety um, with that. So Elohim, a very generic term for God or gods, um, it can be translated as gods or as judge or as ruler. Um, to quote the BDB, which is kind of one of the leading authorities on Hebrew um, Hebrew word meanings, uh, it means Elohim means rulers, judges, either as divine representatives at sacred places or as reflecting divine majesty and power, divine ones, superhuman beings, including God and angels, or godlike. So you see a wide variety there yeah. of what the word can mean. So. Looking back at this passage here, is it talking about, is, is God calling us gods? <sighs> Let's keep plowing ahead. So now it's worth mentioning to go to Exodus 21.6 where I will show it being used again, not as God. Okay, it says this, his master is to bring him to the judges. That word translated there as judges is Elohim, um, which is once again the same word which translates as God. Now, uh, if you have like an NASB, for instance, they'll say like maybe like Lord or Lord God or something like that, and it'll be in all caps and kind of minimized. That's the translation of Yahweh. Yahweh is the only name that God gave us for himself. Adonai is not a name that God gave for himself. It's a name that's used for God. Elohim or El is both generic terms for God, not a name that God gave himself. Yahweh is the only name that specifically is for God. Now, this is interesting because at the beginning of Mark, um, Mark quotes one of the prophets that says the Lord is coming when talking about Jesus' first coming. And the pa passage he's quoting from in the Old Testament, it, the original Hebrew call it says Yahweh is coming. In other words, Mark is associating Jesus as Yahweh. So for those who would have like some kind of problem as Jesus not really being fully God, well, according to Mark, yes, yes, he was fully God. So there's that. Um, so context is extremely important. Extremely important, especially when dealing with ancient texts. You can't go to ancient languages and ancient manuscripts and look to them at the same way as you do nowadays with modern how modern writers write. And, and nowadays, 
you would have to write a lot differently, a lot clearer, a lot, well, just a lot differently. But back then, you know, it's something completely different. And like I said, ancient languages are, we're not really as precise as our modern ones. Um, just as an example, like let's say, for instance, there's a symbol um, that means um, this person or whatever. And then it also means like horse. Well, then as the language develops, it might also mean a, a, a sound, like a, you know, like th, for instance, th which that's not very accurate, but you get what I'm saying. It can stand for a sound. And then as things um, develop, it might, might come to mean for something else. Um, I, I gave this, I gave this uh, kind of example when we were looking at uh, the Exodus. I said that it, it says that um, Israel built store cities. Well, we think storage cities is a city, but back then that's not – it could be a storage building. It could be just a small room with a wall around it. It could be a city. You know, so it had all these different ideas of what it could possibly be, um, and it's the same thing with Elohim. Elohim can really mean – it can really have a wide variety of, of, of uses. So in verse 1 of Psalm 82, I think is really important. It says – oh, I'm sorry. I'm still in Exodus. Let me go back to Psalms. Psalm 82. There we go. In Psalm 82, verse 1, it says, God stands in the divine assembly. So it's kind of in, in, interesting to show that um, from the very beginning of, of chapter 82, he's saying that God is judging the judges. <laughs> That's kind of an important point to make. His pronouncement, he, he, he pronounces judgment among the gods or among the rulers or among the judges. Um which is, which is funny because uh, the authority of the judges comes from God, and he's the one who's there judging them. It's just kind of this ironic kind of setting. And uh, the basic idea of Psalm 82 is, hey, do your jobs. You, you guys aren't doing your jobs. Um, so that should kind of be considered when we're looking at the context. This is the only place in the Old Testament where he says, hey, yeah, you are gods. And he's talking about these, you know, these judges who are not... <laughs> Not judging correctly. They're not doing their job right. <laughs> and so, you know, we can't just take things out of context. So now that takes us to what is the assembly of El? Now it says here, God stands in the divine assembly. The, this is the assembly of El, the assembly of God, the divine assembly. The assembly of El is a reference to Canaanite myth where the head gods would have, he had this like um, council of gods. Um, so he Psalms is referencing this myth from Canaan. This is kind of important because remember the Canaanites were were, were, were did not did not follow God. They did all these you know things that God told them not to do, and Israel moved in and they started doing the same things. So God is God is here having a very pointed way of judging them. He's saying you guys are doing the exact same thing. You know, contrasting them to the the pagan the pagan gods. And so then we get down to verse 6 and 7, which is one of the other uh, really important key parts of this. You know, he said in verses 2 and 3 and stuff, talking about what they should be doing. So here, here in verses 6 to 7, I said you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. However, you will die like humans and fall like any other ruler. So it, the point here is that to pervert justice is to reject God, which is important because, remember, God is drawing a contrast here. And so idolatry is any way of life that is inconsistent with God's concern for justice. And that's exactly what's happening here. You have judges here who are not concerned with God's justice. And so they're doing their own thing, and they're corrupting justice. And as, as a result, God's, God's equating that with idolatry. And so, um, so he says, you are God, you are also the most high, but you're going to die like humans. Now, this is uh, let me kind of keep adding on here, okay? In Canaanite myth, the gods were sons of the Most High, okay? So you have the Most High God, and then the other gods, which are sons of the Most High God, okay? So here, we know that God's already said that he alone is God, okay? God is contrasting the judges with Canaanite gods because of how they were rejecting God's concern for justice. Just like the pagan gods had their own little thing that they could do, he's equating them with, you're not following me. So then you will die like men, through, uh, though you act like gods. It's, he's, it's kind of an ironic way of saying, God's going to cut you down. So it's an ironic condemnation of the judges that reference the culture and context of the times. This is very important, okay? So 
God is condemning the judges. He does this by referencing the culture and the context. This is uh, something that the Israelites would have completely understood what was happening. They would have completely understood what was being said. We, centuries removed, are missing it. <laughs> And it and it plays on the language. Now this is I, I haven't mentioned this yet, so I'll do that now. See the the word Elohim is ruler or judge, but it also means God. Okay, so what he's saying here is he's playing on the fact that it's the same word. I said you are judges. You are all sons of the Most High. See, are are you getting what I'm saying? He because it's the same word for judge and God. It's a play on words. To show how they're acting like they are God and they're not under God's authority, but they're judges. Right. See what I mean? It's a play on word. Yeah. Pretend like we have the same word for judge and God, and the irony surely would not be lost to you. God has a sense of humor. He has a sense of humor, especially in this part. Um, so hashtag, we aren't God's. <laughs> um, that takes us to John. Now, this is the part that... Um, Joyce Meyer read first in her in her thing, and then she goes and reads Psalms 82. And she reads Psalms uh, 82 from the Amplified Bible, which has many, many problems with that. But um, the problem is, is that the Amplified Bible tries to clarify it, and so it, it rewords it like four or five different ways, but those ways aren't necessarily on target. And so then people like Joyce Meyer will come along and they'll, they'll read it. And... They'll say everything that the Amplified says is everything that God has to say. And it's like, no, 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 Only the original manuscripts are inerrant. Every translation is not – cannot measure up to the original manuscripts. That's why there's so many translations. We're trying to get as close to the original as humanly possible. So <clears throat> in John – Sorry, that cough's going to sound terrible on the recording. <laughs> John, uh, on John chapter 10, starting in verse 31, uh, Jesus actually quotes this. So what, what, what's happening is Jesus is, is in the Jerusalem area, and the Jews – it says uh, earlier in the chapter, it says finally the Jews come up to him, and they, they, they try to get him to give a, a simple and plain answer. Can you just give us the answer? Just, just, just simplify this. Are you the Christ? And so Jesus goes into this thing about um, his his works and how he is one with the Father. And so then it says that the Jews, right here in 31, again, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. So this conversation is not going good. <laughs> Verse 32, Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these works are you stoning me? And then verse 33, we aren't stoning you for a good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, making yourself make yourself God. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Isn't it written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called those to whom the word of God came, gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say you are blaspheming to the one uh, blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into the world because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not denying my Father's works, don't believe me. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the, in the Father. Then they were trying again to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. So a lot of stuff going on here. Let's, let's break this apart. Okay, first off, Jesus' argument here is in the law, he referencing Psalm 82, God, God says, hey, um, you are gods. And he says right here in verse 36, no. 35. The, that, that scripture, um, where does it say here? He called the, he, he said that to those whom the word of God came. So in other words, the, let me reword what Jesus is saying here. In Psalm 82, God gave a word to people and told them, you are gods. So if God said that, if someone who did evil was called even ironically gods how could it be wrong for jesus who was sent by god this is what he says in verse 36 do you say you are blaspheming to the one the father set apart and sent into the world if um how could it be wrong for jesus who was sent by god to claim that he was the son of god because he's carrying out and i hope i wrote this somewhere um yeah, I did. Is Jesus teaching that we are all little gods? No. Jesus was sent on a mission by God with God's orders. Therefore, he was a son of God. 
or the Son of God. We trust him. Um, if we trust him, it, 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 there's, that's, I don't know why I didn't do that, but it's supposed to say if we trust him, that, that being Jesus, he, or, I'm sorry, God, uh, he adopts us as sons, right, and as heirs, but we are not equal to God, we're not equal to Jesus, nor are we little gods. So the, it gets a little bit confusing. Why did Jesus bring that up? Well, because they're saying, okay, you're making yourself out to be God. And so he, ha he has this way of kind of challenging their belief, their preconceived bias of, of what the Christ is, without clearly saying one way or another. Not only were Jesus' words right, his works were too. Look at what he says here. If I am not doing my Father's works, don't believe me. But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. So he, he's appealing not just to his words, he's appealing also to the things that he's doing. So not only were Jesus' words right, his works were too. The Antichrist and false teachers won't have that. They, they won't have what? The, their, their words won't be right and their works won't, won't be right. They might, they might perform miracles and that kind of stuff. They might sound real smooth. But if you just listen and pay attention, it's not going to be like Jesus. They're not going to be able to, to perfectly reproduce Jesus. They might do. Uh, they might reproduce miracles or supernatural events. They might say the right things or, or wow you with these speeches or whatever. But when Jesus spoke, his words were of the Father, and then his works were of the Father. So he said, even if you don't believe the things that I say, which he just clarified what he said, he says, believe me on account of my works. <laughs> so, oh, I'm sorry, I exited out there. Okay, there we go. So if you notice, Jesus didn't doesn't comment on the on the context of Psalm 82. He just he just references it. Isn't it written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called those to whom the word of God came, if, if God called the ones that he was bringing to judgment gods, how can you possibly condemn me a blasphemy when when I'm doing the work of God as my words and my works are showing? How can you condemn me when I call myself a son of God? And see, this is the issue, is that he's mentioning something that could be translated in a, in a, in a numerous bunch of ways, and the Pharisees are not, not completely on the same page with how this verse, it's a trouble verse for them. And so Jesus is referencing it in a way that's causing them to question how they're translating that, and to ask, well, are we sons of God? Or are we not? Because this takes us back to the whole Seth tradition, the sons, the righteous line and all that stuff. So now the, the Pharisees are having to question, you know, and, and so they're like, oh, well, we can't stone him, but we can arrest him. And, you know, he slips away and that kind of stuff. But um, So that takes us to Joyce Meyer. Well, hold on. Let me say one more thing. If you notice, some people think that the Pharisees were destined to fail because, because he says this. And in other places, he says, says similar things. Um. It, earlier in the chapter, it's, it's before, the, we didn't read this yet, but um, right here in verse 26. But you don't believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Some take that to then mean that the Pharisees were doomed to not be saved. That they didn't have a choice in the matter, they were not his sheep. Here's the thing, just because they were not at that time his sheep doesn't mean that they could not get saved. If you actually read the Gospels, it, it mentions uh, numerous times Pharisees getting saved. Um, so then if you look at verse 30, it says, But if I am doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. He's insinuating that they have a choice. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the, I in the Father. So they were not destined to not believe. They were not destined to failure in belief in Jesus. Um, so the correct lesson from what Jesus is saying is this. When God has appointed you in authority, you are to act as God's ambassador. The wrong lesson to take from this, you are God. <laughs> See, and without having understanding of the passage, what Jesus was saying, why he was saying that, Joyce Meyer has, has said authoritatively something about it, and that's, that's the problem. So what did she say? She said that we are little gods with a G. We're not – she made a – she was very, very 
uh, clear that we are not God with the capital G, but God with the lowercase g. I don't know exactly what her point was because she didn't clarify it overly well. Once again, the video is on the church's, on the YAMS page. You can go and watch it um, if you need clarity on any of these things or if you want to hear exactly what she said. Um, but uh, uh, what was else I going to say about that? Um, and so her point was that we need to realize who and what we are so that way we can do um, – we, we can do good works to people or, or for people or whatever. And um, there we are of the same kind as God. You know, how cow cow babies are cow kind. How, you know, bird babies are bird kind. So we are God kind or something. And that was her, her thing there. But um, so let's, let's look at this. Exodus 7, 1 mentions uh, Moses being being God. And this is very important because this is actually misquoted. So this is what it actually says. The Lord answered Moses, see, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother will be your prophet. Now, is he saying I have made you God or you are God or a God? No, he's not. He didn't say any of those things. Now, the point is this. Pharaoh was supposed to be a God. The Pharaoh of Egypt was, was seen as a divine being, right? He's God in human form. And whenever uh, whenever he dies, the next pharaoh takes up the mantle as, as divinity and, and so on. It, it, he's, he's, he's a god. Um, Exodus um, actually has a strong contrast. At first glance, it seems like God is trying to get in a fight with the gods of Egypt. But if you actually look closer, it's, it, that's not what's happening at all. God is in a fight with pharaoh as pharaoh being a fake god and god being the real god. Um, so Pharaoh was supposed to be a god. It was a battle between the will of the gods, the will of Pharaoh or the will of Yahweh. And what happened was Pharaoh had to have magicians do the works. He didn't perform any of the works himself. And the magicians weren't able to copy all of them, only some of them. Whereas Moses performed them himself to Pharaoh. And, and didn't uh, God say that to Moses that I would make you like God? That's right. That's that's the passage I read in Exodus seven one, um, and so the point being there that to Pharaoh this was a undermining of his supposed godlike authority. So then, throughout the course of the of this lesson, Meyer said uh, Joyce Meyer said a lot of things that were troubling, and I was going to go through all of them, but honestly, it was like five pages worth. So I decided that was a little bit too much. So I just highlighted some of the biggest things. The first thing is she talks about power consciousness. So basically all you have to do is realize and then walk in that truth that you have realized and that makes it so. Okay, so basically once you realize that you are um, uh, one of the gods, you know, you are you are a, a god, not a, not a big G, whatever that difference means, uh, that then you can walk in it, and in walking in it, you will be able to do the good works that God has called, and that God wants you to do, and, and walk in the power, and um, be able to to achieve that. Um, obviously, th there's a lot of problems with that. First off, we don't realize God makes something that is not. The Holy Spirit does a work in us, and He produces something, right? So. Um, it's not about us realizing something. Next off, uh, power, the problem with power consciousness is it kind of downplays the role of salvation. Um, we are sinners saved by grace. We come to salvation not by realizing anything, but simply by accepting what Jesus has done. It's not about our consciousness. Um, and then there's the obvious thing about you know God's glory and all those things. But the moral of the story being this is a very self-centered, I can achieve based on how I uh, govern my thoughts, and that's the problem. Um, next off is she talks about the gospel like its only purpose is for social good. It's called the social gospel. Uh, in other words, uh, Christian organizations have, or, or Christianity in general is obligated to do good works like um, feeding people who don't have food, housing the homeless, and that kind of stuff, and that is the purpose has nothing to do with the glory of God, with people getting saved, nothing like that. It's all about the social gospel. You see this has kind of gotten, I mean, a great example of this would be the the current um, uh, racial tensions that have been going on for the past couple of years and how the gospel has once again been, you know, um, taken over to talk, to talk about, you know, righting all racial wrongs. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't right racial wrongs, but I the point being that the gospel has to be about Jesus. Once you make it something else, it's not the gospel anymore. It's just 
let's do some good things. But remember that our, our life and our time is, is limited. And if all we do is just, you know, these, these good works and that's as far as it gets, I mean, we're nothing but a social gospel. There's no salvation. Were you going to say something? Um, no. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next thing is she talks about awakening it in us. Uh, I already kind of mentioned that with the power conscious, so I'm going to skip past that. Um, another thing is she misquotes the passage from Genesis where it says that we're made in his image. And she seems to be implying that this, is, that this means that we share God's essence, his, his being. That's no. the problem. It says very clear that, that we were formed from dust and that God breathed life into us. That's a complete difference from us being God-like. Okay? Now, the reason why I, why I point this out is because she said about how when you have a baby, it's mankind, right? When you uh, when a cow has a baby, it's cow kind, and she goes through this and she says, so if God made us, and then she even brings up the thing about us being born again as being birthed by God, and that's a drastic misuse of scripture. That's definitely not what it's teaching at all. Um, but uh, the main idea here being that no, God God did not. When God says that we are made in His image, what that means is we have consciousness. We have a measure of authority, and what I mean by that is that God put us over the earth, right? We were supposed to care for it, nurture it. We were made in his image. Also, we are expected to, to have um, authority structures that carry out the law, right? Things like um, if I go and murder somebody, it's mankind's job to arrest me and punish me. God has made us in his image to carry out his rule and his law on the earth. That doesn't mean that we take his place. That means that we are to act as, as his hands and feet in his creation. Do you understand like, the difference? Like stewards. Right? Like stewards. Yes. Exactly like stewards. Yes. Right on. Yes. Exactly. But that does not make us equal with. That just simply means that we have a task. Completely different. So, uh, the next thing... Um, she talks about us having the, basically how we have the power in us. No, we don't have the power in us. It's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, God doing a work in us, that completely different. Um, uh, and then we have to take our place. No, 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 no. There's just so many different things wrong with that, and I don't have time to get all into it. But mm. And then the last thing she said is because we are not taking our place, it's making the earth shake, and that's why things are going wrong in the world. Um, no. Hebrews, for instance, talks about the way God shaking the earth, or the prophets, where it talks about God doing the shaking. Um, and it says about how God raises up and God lowers down. It's not about us and our placement. It's about God being the master and the creator of all of it. And remember that the end times, that's something that's going to happen. That's not something that us realizing our place and rising up and whatever her point was with that, that's not going to change it. The end will still come regardless of whether or not we try and establish a permanent hierarchy or whatever the crap she was talking about. So obviously you can see that this this is really complicated and it's hard to give just a straight yes or no answer about whether or not Joyce Meyer is a false teacher or not. I, I, I was able to kind of point, pinpoint a few things. She, do, she doesn't understand the verse that she is quoting. That's kind of important because if you're going to teach something, you should have a complete understanding of what you're teaching. That's just typical, like basic stuff. Also, if you're going to teach something that goes against traditional Orthodox Christianity, you need to have a really good argument for it. For instance, traditional Orthodox Christianity says that we are not gods, even with the little g. So then, if you're going to go turn around and say, no, we are gods because of my understanding of this verse, then you need to be, you need to have some, some very good research to back up your claim. Like, give me something to work, up, work with. If you're asking me to completely turn my back on historical Christianity, you need to give me a good reason. And the, pro the troubling thing about this is there's a lot of obvious false teachers who teach this, that we are little gods. And by her teaching it as well, she's kind of align aligning herself with them. So new age. It, it really – well, it's not just New Age. It's also a Prosperity Gospel, and um, there's another one. I um, don't remember what the other one is, but <clears> – does she still believe that that's a very good question, I would like to ask? And could – she get more clarity on what exactly is the difference between a big G and a little g by us being gods and 
God? What, what, it, what exactly could she be a little bit more clear? Because the video had, I can draw my own conclusions from what she was saying, but I would still like to kind of ask her because maybe she doesn't realize, maybe she doesn't realize exactly what she's saying. You know what I mean? Maybe she's saying something and she doesn't realize the implications of it. You know what I mean? So I, I really like to be able to, to just get a little bit more clarity on that. Maybe I'm giving her too much grace. I don't know, but I know that mercy is a good idea to stick with. And when in doubt, even just a shred of doubt, find clarity before you rush to a conclusion. Isn't that something you said, though? I think last week is whenever people are kind of teaching non biblical things, they kind of get vague and yep. don't yep. get Yep. And I don't know if that's just her teaching style or if that's intentional. And once again, what exactly does she mean by those terms? Because if you remember, I also said that they use it kind of like cult like. Well, they use the same words for different things. So, what if she's calling us gods, but what she actually means is saints? If she's using it in that sense, well, it's not necessarily wrong. It's just that I wouldn't use the word gods, I would use a different word. I would probably just use saints. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, anyways, um, uh, and she uses an amplified Bible. Oh, which is terrible because she doesn't understand the original language. So she, you, those are like the two greatest sins, using an Amplified Bible while not understanding the original language. It's just terrible. Because the Amplified Bible, it says, is, let's say the Bible says this. Um, Nicole just took a drink from her cup. The Amplified would say, Nicole, the girl, took a drink, a drought, a sip, a, you see what I mean? And it'll go through all these different things. Of her drink, her cup, her 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 what? See what I mean? It'll go through all these different things, and it's like, well, that's not really on target. You know, your amplification is more of just a confusing of the lines, and I, I hate that she uses the amplified because it it gives it gives more opportunity for misunderstanding, and then with her lack of understanding of the original language, it just makes it doubly doubly terrible. Um, my knowledge of Hebrew is very rudimentary, and I still am able to pick up pick apart her 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 misunderstanding. That's pretty sad, you know. I, I'm Greek is my strong suit, so you know the fact that she quoted a Hebrew text without without even having any knowledge of the fact that the psalmist was making a play on words, calling them gods because it's a it's the same word as ruler and judge. It's it's a really funny thing to do, but she didn't even mention that. All Her only point was that we are gods, the Bible says so. Well, not really. It doesn't really say so. You have one part that's vague that you don't under, even understand. Anyways, the one place where it is vague, the false misquote for their agenda. They always do it. They always will. Does God clearly say we are gods? No, he does not. He does not clearly say that anywhere. One part in Psalms that Jesus quotes for the purpose of trying to teach them a lesson about him being the Christ. That's all you have, and basing a whole thing on that. I, I, I've taught this in a bunch of classes. It's not always true, but it's worth keeping in the back of your mind. Try and not form an entirely new anti-Christian doctrine based off of one vague passage. Try to establish it off of at least three. That's how cults are formed. Yeah, right, from one vague passage that you just run wild with, which is why I, I always tell people who aren't overly comfortable with the Bible to follow the three-verse principle. If you can find it three times in the Bible, then bring me bring me this new revelation of something that the Christian doctrine has missed. But you need to find at least three passages before you start doing this. The last generation did this with saying that there was an intermediate place, right? There was heaven and hell, but before before Jesus came and died... There wasn't heaven and hell. There was like another place called paradise, and, and then they had this whole doctrine based off of one passage, and then they and then they they went over to Luke and jerked it out of context to try and support that one passage. So at best they only had two verses, which once again in context no. So then they went over to where Paul says he went to the third heaven, which is I can easily explain based on Greek thought of the time. And say that that's, that that's backing it up, too. Well, so that's technically is three, yeah. But keep in mind that only one of them is the vague part, and the other two are jerked out of context to support that one. So doesn't really count. Anyways, were you about to say something? Yeah. 
explaining it that way, it would be like somebody trying to base a whole doctrine off of Jesus' way. Mm -hmm. People have done that. Really? Yes. Yes. Jesus apparently did not have full knowledge and was not fully God because he wept. He was in utter despair, um, and he didn't know what was going to ha happen. He, so he crossed his fingers and hoped to God that Lazarus was going to raise the dead, or he was going to look like an idiot. Yes. Wow. From that one verse, a complete misunderstanding. Yes, absolutely. Even though that would be a complete contradiction with what Jesus says in like the next two verses, but whatever. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So does God clearly say we are gods? No. Or is it something that can be twisted under the guise of hidden mysteries that we need to reclaim? Yeah. They're trying to reclaim a hidden mystery that was never hidden. There's this idea that the, that the church was just like hiding all these different things. And, and then that Dan Brown book didn't make it any better. Um, uh, I think the second one was called Angels and Demons or something. But the mm -hmm. first one was called... Um, it was really popular, uh, yeah. probably about 15 years ago or something, but... Um, Do you make sense? I have angels. Just can't remember the Is it a book? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then they made it into a movie with uh, Tom Hanks. Gave him a ridiculous haircut. Um, crap, dang it, what was the name of that? Yeah. You gonna find the it? The Da Vinci Code. What? Yes, the Da Vinci Code. The idea was that the early church hid all these secret things and stuff, and it's just that's that's so not that's so much nonsense because the church didn't start as the imperial church. It started as as segments. I mean, not segments, but as 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 different groups that were not always in in direct contact with them. So, like for instance, this area of Christians would have one gospel. This area over here had a different gospel. So as they became more, as they became bigger and kind of started to meet more and discuss stuff, they said, well, we have these four Gospels. Well, ours is a little bit different than yours here and here. And so then somebody came along and said, let's, let's fix this. So he got all the, all the four Gospels and tried to make one, one Gospel with no, no mistakes in it. And, you know, tried to, tried to fix all that. And the early church said, N no, 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 those aren't really errors. You, you, you're, you're seeing a problem where there isn't one. We want to keep the uniqueness of the four because we don't think that anything here is a contradiction. And so that we have the four Gospels still to today. There, There's there's no validation for, for that. And if you look, whereas you can you can find the hidden teachings in like the, the Gnostics, for instance, and you can see like the, the Gospel of Thomas. You can see this this one sect over here that where the Gospel of Thomas was, was you know um, – that they had these certain things that other Gnostic cults didn't have. And so you see that with the secret teachings, all their secret teachings were different. None of the, the Gnostics didn't all agree on what the secret teachings were. So then out of that, you have the actual church who said, no, 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 we're telling you the truth. And Peter and Paul, they, they talked about this a lot. We're, not, we're telling you the truth exactly as we, as it was given to us, we're handing it down to you. How many times have they, have they, did they say that? And furthermore, well, I this is this is not a not a time to talk about the Gnostics as much as I'd love to. So getting back on topic, um, no, there there's no there's no basis for this hidden mystery nonsense. Um, and the big the big problem that I have with what she, what Joyce is saying is not that she misunderstood something. But she said it in such an authoritative way, like she really knew. And she, the way she said it was very clear. We are elevated in, in her what she's teaching, and Christ is lowered. There, there's, this, there's, almost, there's almost no distinction in what she's saying between what we are and what Christ is. That's a problem. Because um, Johnson does this, Bethel Church does this. With the Holy Spirit, we are on par with Jesus. We can do the same thing he did because the only way he did it was with impairment to the Holy Spirit, and we have access to that same Holy Spirit. What? He was he was God. And you see this teaching creep up in different ways, in different words. Like, for instance, Jesus was actually tempted. He could have sinned. Jesus was tempted. He could not have sinned. But surely, no, God cannot be tempted. Is Jesus God? Yes. Can Jesus be tempted? No. Or if he can be tempted, he's not really God. So why would Mark equate him as Yahweh of the Old Testament? We have a really serious problem with that. So, 
We are elevated while Christ is lowered. There's, she doesn't teach anything about our dependence on God. She's too busy talking about how we need to come into the mental realization of who we are. And there, there's no clarifying the original meaning. She's not even interested in what it originally meant. She read it in her Amplified Bible, and then she just took it for what, it, what she wanted it to mean, and she just ran with it. So the final analysis, as far as I can tell, yes, she appears to be a false teacher. I've given this a lot of thought. I've gone over it back and forth. I don't think you should ever rush to calling somebody a false teacher. But as far as I can tell, yeah, I would say she's a false teacher. Or at the very least, she gave a false lesson. And she very, very, very regularly teaches other things from that false belief. See, that she has that false belief of our power consciousness. And then from that one false belief, she has all these other things that comes out from that and has a bunch of false teachings based on that one false belief. As far as I can tell, she is a false teacher. But I will say this, just because she's a false teacher doesn't mean that there's nothing that she said that's good. It just means you have to wade through a bunch of crap to get to the good. So what I would recommend is I would recommend not reading her books unless you're strong enough to be able to pick through and see all the different things. Now, once again, if you think that you're strong, be careful lest you fall. Um, because you can kind of, you know, mislead yourself and that kind of stuff. And what people do is they say, I'm real strong in the faith, so then they get all by themselves and they do their own studies and they don't rely on the rest of the church, and so they're out there being an island all by themselves, and so then they fall to their false teachings because they're not depending on the church. It's a bad place to be in. Anyways, um, as far as I can tell, she is a false teacher, and I brought this thing that, that I think is, is going to help. Um, kind of clarify why I think so. This is Declarations for Your Life. Um, it's done by Joyce Meyer. Um, and she says, Below is a partial list of confessions taken from God's Word that I began praying and speaking out over my life in the early 1980s. Well, see, that's another that's another uh, mistake, is you don't speak things out into your life. There's this idea that, oh, speak it into your life. Speak it existence. That's nowhere in the Bible you pray, and, and you know... <laughs> And this is taken to odd extremes too. Like if you if you have cancer, just don't admit it, don't say it, and you won't have it. And it's like, what kind of nonsense is this? Anyways, um, I am a believer, not a doubter. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that, except that we all have moments of doubt, so it's a little bit vague. I love all people. That's easier said than actually lived. And I am loved by all people. Well, that's just blatantly lie. In fact, Jesus even talked about the way that they will hate you because they hated me. So that can't be, that can't possibly be true. Just trust my sins. Right, yeah. I prosper in everything I put my hand to. No, I don't. I oftentimes fell. I oftentimes hit barriers and walls. I mean, anybody who's been a pastor can tell you this. You, 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 work, on, you work with people, you work with people, and then... They go and do the thing that, that you warn them about, and then they screw their life up, and then they come back, and you try and help them rebuild again. That That's that's hard. I prosper in everything about my hand, too. No, I don't. I tried piano for years, and I didn't prosper in it. I, uh, you know, I, there's, I could go down a list of stuff. I am blessed in all areas of my life. I am blessed. But that's not overly helpful. I am blessed in my life spiritually. Yes, I would agree with that. Financially, well, that depends on my decisions. Uh, mentally... Well, I'm oftentimes suicidal, have anxiety and depression. Um, no, I wouldn't say that. I would say that God has helped me to um, wade through those things. But Which I wouldn't... Which is a blessing in itself. What? Which is a blessing in itself. Yes, exactly. God helping me. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, and socially, um, I'm not sure what that one means. Um, I know God's voice and I always obey what he tells me. That's more of a struggle, though. It's not... You know what I mean? Like, even Jeremiah had times of, of where he, he didn't want to obey. So, mm, and I know God's voice. Well, even those who most know God's voice can still be misled. I mean, you go through these, these and they're just kind of not overly not overly helpful because they're saying things that, that aren't over... Like, here's a good example. This one. I am slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. I'm not. Maybe a better way of addressing that would be to say it like this. Be slow to speak, quick to hear, and slow to anger. Ah! Now we're not declaring something. We're, we're, we're trying to... You see what I mean? We're, we're working on something. 
and she she had she had other things on here, but you get what I'm saying. As my 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 final analysis that is, yes, she is a false teacher. Little gods is nowhere present. If you look at the entire Bible, the part in Psalm 82 and the part in John, nowhere in there does it say God with little g. It never says you are little gods. It never said that. So what she's doing is she's taking it and she's twisting it to tw to to validate her twisted belief. You are little gods, God with a little g. That's not what the Bible said. It said you are gods. So if you're going to take it out of context, you might as well go the full nine yards and just say we're big gods. Because little gods isn't in the Bible. Um, this is very important because context has always is key. Be a lover of truth, not a lover of feelings and chills. There's always going to be something that tickles your fancy that sounds real good that doesn't make it true. Don't see yourself as more spiritual than them. This is what you see people doing all the time. I'm so much more spiritual than the false teachers. Be very careful. Be very, very, very careful. You should always approach God with humility, not with pride and arrogance. Don't be too quick to open your mouth either. Sometimes I've been so sure that, some, that something was a certain way and I was wrong. You can be wrong. Uh, be teachable and don't teach your agenda from your point of view. Try and try and really try and really find out what God's idea is on the thing. And then next, then the last thing on this that we, when we come back in two weeks, uh, we're going to talk about the fivefold ministry and what that is, and whether it's biblical and all that stuff. Um, the thing is that many people they just want to get a position in a church, so they'll be they'll they'll say things and do things that they think will help them to get that position. And you know they'll even if the, if they can't get a position with the pastor they'll try and start up a home Bible study in somebody's house, and then they'll you know have three or four people from the church and they'll start doing their own weird things and having their little prayer parties and stuff and just weird things. Um, there's actually a lot of people around here who do the do these like um, healing prayer home Bible study things and it's like okay <laughs> it just gets dark it's like a little Benny Hinn or something so. Um, for that, I would strongly recommend the book of James, specifically James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many should become teachers, my brothers, because you know that we will receive a stricter judgment. That's something that we should always remember. Anytime you feel, if you ever get into a place of, of getting into false teachings and, well, I, I just, you know, for, I'm going to form this little Bible study in somebody's house and not everyone should be teachers because you're going to be judged a whole lot harsher. So... Um, I, I mean, and that's, that's, we're going to just gonna stop there. I mean, we already went 47, 48 minutes on this and I cut out five pages, five pages talking about Joyce Meyer. That's how much study I did. And so if I would have done the whole five, say we would have either been here till 830 or we would have had to do this for multiple weeks and cancel the pizza party. So for, I, I hope you understand why I didn't give a complete full analysis. You're going to watch the video and you're going to see a bunch of things I didn't mention. This is why. Because I cut out five pages already and it's already 48 minutes. It's on the YAMS Facebook page, yes. Any questions or comments? We are done with this series. We're done talking about the white lies and the false and all that stuff. We're done with it. Next thing up that we're going to talk about in two weeks after the, pizza, the week after the pizza party is the fivefold ministry. And then we're going to go to talking about um, good. What does it mean to be good? What is good? Are we good? That kind of stuff. And then after that study, we're going to look at um, uh, a couple of the different prophets. And we're just going to take apart the books and do like a, a real in-depth Bible study of those books. Um, one of them is Obadiah. I think the other one is um, – I have it written down. I don't remember what it was. Uh, I think it's um, Habakkuk maybe. Uh, but anyways, any questions? No? Okay.